Uh, my name is Stan Wilson. I'm a chief program specialist with the Illinois State FSA office. I'm located in Springfield, Illinois. Um, I'm a 35-year uh, career employee with the uh, Farm Service Agency. I've been in the Illinois State office since uh, 1988, so um, my career is getting fairly long in the tooth. Um, but I must say that um, I enjoy um, any time we implement a new farm bill because it's a challenge um, um, to learn something new, to educate producers, figure out the nuances of the new farm bill. So uh, it's an exciting time in that aspect for uh, FSA. Uh, it's challenging, maybe exciting, but challenging for producers. Um, I, again, I want to say uh, thank you to um, the Farm Doc, uh, Crop Extension Service University of Illinois folks, uh, for the invitation uh, to conduct this webinar on the ARC PLC program yield updates, and also for the use of their resources and technology. Uh, we have a great partnership with um, uh, Property Extension Service, University of Illinois, and other partners, uh, specifically um, the last uh, few weeks, there's been some regional ARC PLC uh, uh, program seminars are being held. In fact, the last two are being held today. Um, the, the job uh, and responsibility of educating producers about the farm bill is a huge job, and it's always uh, rewarding when we have partners assist in that endeavor. Uh, we're going to get started here. We're going to be talking about our uh, PLC program. I mentioned um, um, in my conversation that you logged on a little early. Uh, there have been other um, webinars conducted by uh, Farm Doc folks. Uh, they're archived. They're, they're about the ARC PLC program. They touch on yield updates, but this webinar is is going to delve more deeply into the yield update process and then those other webinars did and uh, i'll present uh, my powerpoint uh, slides and then uh, we'll take uh, questions at the conclusion of that at that time period and so let's get started uh, of course um, there are two uh, yield update options and only two uh, the first one is retain the farm's current CC yields. Notice I'm not saying direct yields. If you're familiar with the direct and counter sickle program and the acre program, they have direct yields. Uh, it's to retain the counter cyclical yields. The other option is to update the farm's CC yields using yield data from the years 2008 to 2012 and then taking a simple average. And we do exclude any zero planted years. And I want to point out that the yield update option uh, is available for all farms, regardless of program participation or program election, um, whether the farm is often on the road in PLC, um, price loss coverage, or ARC um, agriculture risk coverage. So don't worry about whether you're going to be in PLC or you're going to be in ARC, you have this option to update your, your, your yields regardless of program election. In this example, and this is something that's been covered before, but it just shows an example of a history of a particular farm that has five years of planted acreage, and the years are 2008 to 2012. Uh, in this case, the uh, Certification, the yield certification uh, for corn is 120, 115, 125, 130. In 2012, it's 109. The average county yield, 75% level, or the substitute yield for this particular county is 112. And you notice the substitute yield is the same for the entire period, 2008, 2012. And Every county will have their own substitute yield. In this case, the certified yields for the four years eight and eleven exceed the substitute yield, or some people refer to it as the flood yield. But in 2012, the substitute yield of 112 is larger than the 109. So we strike out the 109, we use the 112, we get a 
five-year average then of 602, an average, a simple average, it's not weighted, at 120, the law and the regs say it's 90%. So we take 120 times 90, we get 108. And it's very simple then. You compare the current CC yield of 92 with 108, which one do you want? You want the higher yield. In this second example, um, it's 105 versus 115, so you'd want the 115. What this shows, though, on this slide is we exclude zero planted acres. So it's only a three-year average, 2010, 11, and 12, again, using a substitute yield. In this case, the 122 is larger than the 119. Now, if we had a zero plant for four years out of the five and only had one year that had a uh, had corn planted, then the simple average would be a one-year average. So we do exclude zero plant years. Why is the yield update option um, important? Well, because it's the first time in many years that yields can be updated. And in many areas of the United States, the farm's CCC yield is, is quite frankly, well below the yield produced on the crop today. And there are, in some cases, where 90% of the substitute yield in the county may be larger than the farm's current CC yield. And it has been said uh, numerous times by um, Clark Extension Service, uh, our mural, uh, others, uh, written literature, that that owners have been given the opportunity to update the farm's yields, and they should. So 1985 was the last time we could update yields for all covered commodities. In 2002, you could update your yields for covered commodities if you chose base option four. But in many cases, producers did not elect that option because it, would, it was tied to um, base reallocation as well. And to update their yield, they might have actually suffered uh, on their base acre side of things, and so they chose not to use base option four and update their yields. And if they did take base option four, uh, as many or as some producers did, uh, we're seeing cases where it's still advantageous to go ahead and update their yields again under this opportunity, uh, even though they updated it as late as or as, as recently as 2002. In 2008, uh, pulse crops were added, and they could update their yields. That didn't have a lot of bearing in Illinois. That's really uh, not uh, germane to the crops we produce in Illinois. The yield update uses, um, we'll use the retained or updated PLC yields Again, that's the two options. Either keep your current CC yield or update it, and your current CC yield, uh, if it's retained, or the updated yield will become your PLC yield, and it will be used for PLC payments. It will not be used for ARC uh, payments, whether it's ARC County or ARC IC. Uh, your farm record yield uh, will be retained based on whether uh, you use your current CC yield or your updated PLC yield. In other words, it's going to be a matter of your farm record. And so it's going to be preserved by FSA. What's the significance of that? If you don't choose or elect PLC, it'll be there and available for future farm program purposes. And I'm here to tell you, I have no idea Come the next farm bill, what time of what type of farm bill will be, what type of potential payments there will be, but I think it's generally understood that if you have a higher yield, your payments will end up being higher. And even if the next farm bill may not utilize these updated yields, there's always the next farm bill. And so it may may not be for you. 
to ever utilize, but it may be for your son or your grandkids to, to utilize, or if you're looking at the value of your farm, have a higher yield at some point in time whenever you would put that up for sale. A higher yield would generally equate to an incentive to pay more money for you, the purchaser of your farm. Again, I want to say direct payment yields will not be used under this farm bill. Um, we will, though, uh, preserve those, and so they will be on your farm record. If in the future there might be a farm bill that provides for the use of direct yields. So they're not going away uh, into oblivion. Uh, they're, they're going to be held in advance in case in the future we ever need direct payment yields, but they will not be used under this farm bill. I also want to point out that uh, if you choose to update, you can choose to update on a crop by crop basis, and it's the owner that has the opportunity to make this decision. The crop must have uh, base acres, and again, the yield is a simple average of certified yields for the 2008 through 2012 crop years, again, excluding uh, zero plant years. If you decide you want to update one crop but not another, that's fine. If you want to update the yield on all crops, that's fine as well. Again, it excludes the uh, years of zero planting in, in the simple average calculation. Again, it's not a weighted yield calculation, and it's not an Olympic average calculation, which we've seen in past farm bills or other aspects of this farm bill. Uh, substitute uh, yields are available. If the yields, the actual yields are low, or zero due to missing records. And that's where you have um, missing records for the entire farm acreage or just part of the farm's acreage. So we also refer to the plug yield, substitute yield, and we also refer to a partial plug or partial substitute uh, yield. So how's the substitute yield calculated? Well, it's calculated at the county level, first of all. So it's not at your farm level. It's not at the state level. It's at the county level. And it is a 2008 to 2012 uh, simple average in the county times 75%. And the calculated substitute yield is the same yield for each year, eight to 12, as I pointed out, uh, previously. And the substitute yields are posted at the ARC PLC webpage. And this is FSA's main webpage. There's a lot of information contained on that uh, webpage, uh, this URL. Um, if, if you haven't been there, I would encourage you to go take a look at this webpage. And you can see uh, the information that's been made available to the public. And there'll be additional information that's being posted there all the time. Uh, on, not on a daily basis, but periodically. And this is a, um, actually uh, the web page and the URL is listed here to find the substitute yields. And in this red box, you'll see it says view substitute yields for updating PLC yields. Now, there's a whole bunch of other links in this area here that might be of interest to you if you haven't been to this uh, this website. Let's just take a quick look at, at that. Here's the actual um, live uh, website. Now, here is the view substitute yields. This is a different color when I'm not having my, my mouse over it because that's where I was at last. But 
The use section yields for updated PLC payments would be right here. And if I were to click on this, this is what I get. And so this is the substitute yields <laughs> that are available. Um, this is for corn, it's hard to read here, but it gives you corn, wheat, soybeans, oats, grain sorghum, and it gives us all of the other uh, commodities. And keep in mind, obviously, these first five are the predominant crops in Illinois. Now, you can see we do have a rice yield, so you may not know that. Um, we have um, canola uh, in a couple of counties, uh, sunflowers in a few counties. And if you scroll on out over here, you can see there's sesame, chickpeas, um, mustard, cranberry. Um, and you see that we really don't have yields for those. So we're predominantly looking at these categories. I'm located here in Sangamon County. So if we go to Sangamon County, we can see for corn, the substitute yield is 123, uh, wheat is 48, and soybeans is 40. Grain sorghum is 64. So this is, when we talk about Substitute yields are plug yields, including partial plugs. Uh, this is where you would go to to get your substitute yields for your county. Now, keep in mind, for the most part, that means for most of you, that's where the county is physically located. But keep in mind, we have some farming operations where they transferred the administrative county from the physical location county to the uh, neighboring county. And so you need to be careful um, of that whenever you're selecting your um, plug or substitute yield. So we're back to our, our PowerPoint. A substitute yield is authorized in the following situations. And remember, the crop had to be planted on the farm in the applicable year. Otherwise, we exclude that year. There is no substitute yield. That the yield is lower than the uh, certified yield, perhaps due to a disaster condition, but, uh, whether it's drought, a hailstorm, uh, excessive rainfall. Uh, it could also be a situation where, and it happens occasionally, where someone sprayed the wrong field or they sprayed the field with the wrong uh, chemical. Um, now keep in mind, though, uh, a substitute yield will only be used in the case that case if it is in, exceeds the farm's actual uh, yield. If you have one field that's accidentally sprayed and the rest of the farm has uh, made a, a pretty good yield, you can't use a substitute or plug yield for that particular field that was. Uh, sprayed with their own chemical. You're going to use the actual yield for that field and the other fields come up with a certified yield and you would only use the substitute yield then if uh, it's higher than the actual yield for those blended farm fields yields. You can use a substitute yield if the yield data is uh, unavailable. You can use it as substitute yield if the crop is being taken for use other than grain or seed, such as grazing or, or hay or, or silage. The owner uh, may not be able to obtain the yield data from a producer who is no longer on the farm. The producer retired or the farm tenancy was terminated. And for whatever reason, the owner is unable to obtain that yield data. Or the owner may have some acreage, um, but not all acreage of a crop in a particular year. For example, I have um, 200 acres in a particular year, um, but the next um, year I bought a 20 that lay, lay close to that uh, my farm, and I don't have the production evidence from that 20 acres. So I can use a partial plug for that 20 acres if I'm unable to get the yield data from that previous owner and or operator.
the producer may not be able to provide or, and this is key, chooses not to provide yield data for the years the crop was planted. Then we can use a substitute yield. Now, a producer may choose not to provide the evidence because one, they may know that their yields are below the substitute yield. Or they may not wish to go through the time and effort to gather all their data, documentation, and do the computations. Maybe their life, they're, they're just too busy, their circumstances are such that they don't make that a priority and they don't want to do that. Or they may not want to be subject to spot check. Maybe that's a concern of theirs. So they just choose not to provide the data, then we can use a substitute yield for the years the crop was planted. And in this instance, the producer can certify to a zero yield for each year the crop was planted, 2008 to 12. Now they would not certify to the zero year for, for years the crop was not planted. They would just leave that blank. Because remember, it's a simple average of the years the crop was planted. And a zero yield signifies the crop was planted in that year which is different than a zero plant uh, designation. In some counties, as I mentioned previously, the substitute yield, 90% um, of the substitute yield as a simple average for the years the crop was planted may be greater than the uh, current CC yield. The owner, can certify to zero yields in in the planted acre years and take the substitute yields. And the yield software will use the larger of the owner's actual certified yield or the substitute yield for each uh, actual year. In situations where an owner has a part of the acres, but not all the acres, as I mentioned previously, the owner can calculate the yield to be certified by using the substitute yield on the acres of crop that they did not have. They'll add that uh, production or yield to the yield they had from the same crop in that same year, and then they divide that and they'll get the total acres of the crop on the farm. And the higher of the calculated yield or substitute yield would be permitted to be used on the yield certification. So what does that all mean? Well, here's an example. Uh, Bob was an operator in 2014 on farm serial number 1,111. Bob is updating his wheat CC yield in 2008, which is the first year of the, of the base of the time period we're looking at for yield update. One track of today's farm was farmed by Joe, which the, who was the previous owner, and the other track by Bob. In 2008, both Bob and Joe had 100 acres of wheat. Joe will not or cannot pr provide Bob the 2008 wheat production from Joe's track. When certifying the 2008 yield, Bob can use his 50 bushel acre yield or the 5,000 bushels from his uh, one, 100 acres. Bob can use the county substitute yield of 30 bushels per acre or 3,000 bushels for the 100 acres of Joe's farming operation in 2008. Bob can then certify to a 2008 yield of 40 bushels an acre. And for 2008, the yield software We'll use the larger of the 40 acres, which is that actual yield plus a partial plug, or the substitute yield of 30 acres. In this case, the 40 is higher than 30, then our software will automatically use the 40 bushels in calculating the potential uh, updated yield to be compared to the current uh, CC yield.
it is the uh, owner's decision and um, there may be multiple owners on the farm, um, but an owner can make the decision, not uh, an operator, not another tenant. And their decision is to retain or update, retain the current CC yield or update it based on the yield certification for a particular crop. Again, it's not tied to program election. It won't be used though if the elect and enroll in PLC, not if they elect our county or our IC, but as I mentioned previously, we need to not lose sight of future potential programs that might be enacted after this farm bill that might utilize that yield. And it will allow uh, the yield to reside on our farm records duration of this farm bill and be available then for future farm bills. The yield is determined by the owner, again, whether it's a, a CC or updated yield, and it will become known as the PLC yield. The decision to retain our updated yield, it's made on a crop by crop basis, and again, regardless of the program election. Only one owner of farm needs to sign on a, CC, a form CCC 858 to sign for the yield update decision. And now in lieu of an owner, if you have an operator or anyone else uh, with a power attorney that is authorized to sign for the owner as their agent, and it's a power attorney that has all current and future programs and all actions uh, checked on the FSA 211, which is our power attorney form, then that person can act on behalf of that one owner. Now, the owner or their agent of certifying on the CCC 858 to the yield choices is certifying and it is understood that they have the consent of all owners on the farm to make the base and yield update decisions. And it will not be a problem unless another owner would come in and would contradict that individual previous owner's decision. Now I can't expect that we'd have too many uh, conflicts over yields. Uh, maybe we might have some over base reallocation, um, but I would hope that we have very, very few uh, situations where you'd have owners that are conflicting uh, one another with wanting uh, different options with its base reallocation or yield updates. Again, we only need one owner uh, to perform this action, and it's not the operator. And even if the operator has power of attorney and they're signing for the owner, it's still not the operator making the decision because they're signing on behalf of the owner. It's as if the owner were signing that form. I've already mentioned the several times of thing now that PLC, PLC yields used only for PLC payment purposes. It's not used for our county or our IC. And this is the first time I mentioned it other than before the webinar actually started and we were waiting on, on the point of time. This deadline to make a yield and base reallocation decision is February 27th. That's not far away, a couple of weeks away. If you haven't made the decision yet and you desire to do so, then I'd ask that you contact your county office as soon as possible to schedule an appointment when they might be able to, to service your request. Again, don't be surprised if you're given an appointment date after February 27th and that's permissible because they'll be placing you on a register and that will hold your place in line. And even if you make your um, yield update or base reallocation decisions after February 27th, it will still be considered timely. What you don't want to do though is be in a situation where you contact the office after February 27th and tell them you want to make a yield update and or base reallocation decision and they're going to tell you it's too late 
that you had to contact them on or before February 27th and had to be placed on the register if they couldn't service you. The yield certification is going to be made at the farm level. It is a certification and it is a yield per acre, not production certification. This is different than what we use was used by FSA for the 2002 farm mill or the acre program, where we looked at production. In other words, we want to know, you know, how many bushels was it? Uh, in this case, we just want a yield per acre, uh, not what the total production was. Now, after a yield update is completed at the farm level, FSA behind the scenes is going to move these yields uh, to the track level for tracks that have base acres. Now, the yields may be adjusted after being moved to the track, but only if all owners agree to the adjusted yields. So that's a little different because the yield update decision can be a single owner. But to move or adjust those yields from one track to another are gonna require all owners to agree. If yields are not updated uh, for the crop, the current year CC yield will remain with the current track with base. As I mentioned, they can be adjusted if all owners agree. But when we adjust the yields of, of a track, the yield increase and the bushels associated with the increase must be offset from yields at other tracks on the farm. Because the, the policy is that the yield adjustments will never result in the farm yield being increased or decreased. So if you have a farm that consists of two tracks, say one of them is an upland track and the other one is a bottomland track, and the yield history on those two tracks are very different, and the bottomland track historically has a higher yield, for example, and the upland has a lower yield, then you can, the owners can, if they agree, they can adjust the yield downward on the upland track and adjust it up on the bottom line track, but as long as the yield extensions don't increase for the farm. So in other words, whatever you gain on one track, you're going to lose on another track or tracks on the farm. The owners can certify yields on the farm again on a crop by crop basis, and anyone on the farm can certify the yields. That's on a CCC 859, and that's where you give us the bushels or pounds depending <laughs> on the crop uh, yield. And it doesn't require a signature, but only the owner of the farm can make the actual final yield update decision by signing or their agent by signing a CCC 858, which would tell FSA that the decision is to either retain or update the yield or to retain or reallocate the basis. So it's the owner's decision, not the operator's decision. The owner is not required to submit actual yield and production records whenever they're updating their yields. In fact, we will not accept them. The type of yield data used to make the certification must be recorded as listed on the certification form. And you'll see number one is RMA data. Number two is production sold or commercial uh, docu documents such as settlement sheets or scale tickets, on-farm storage, livestock, FSA loan record, FSA NAP, which is a uh, non-insured assistance program, like similar to uh, crop insurance, but for those commodities that don't have crop insurance available, and then others. Number one is number one for a reason, RMA data. That is the number one preferred method. So on an 858, the type of production that is going to be used to certify the yield is going to be identified. And again, FSA will not copy or store the yield or production records. We do not have time nor resources 
more than money, the cost of photocopying and toner uh, to photocopy those, bait stamp them, get them back to you. The owners must be prepared to submit records using certified yields if requested by FSA, and it's any time 14 through 18. So keep this in mind. You're an owner out there, you're an operator, and you're the ones with records, and the owner decides to update the yield. We can come in as late as 2018 and say, hey, Mr. Owner, that's who we're going to ask to go to one signed to 858. We need to see your records. Again, RMA records are acceptable records. In fact, the use of RMA review data <coughs> is encouraged as FSA and RMA share data, and it's reviewable by FSA. And the RMA yield data used to certify the yields are yields that make up the RMA APH database. Now, Jonathan had mentioned to me previously, we had a question about uh, RMA APH yield that had already been presented. So I, I want to try to answer the question at this point in time in these next couple of slides. Keep in mind that RMA APH yield cannot be used. And why? Because it's a four to a 10 year average yield with yield adjustments. There's replacement yields, T yields, there's all kinds of things that are in this APH yield, assigned yields. So you cannot use your RMA APH yield. Yield supported by RMA yield data is considered a FSA review criteria. That's significant. So what that means is um, RMA data is subject to review annually on yield audits before indemnity claims of high dollars are paid and, and, and other routine audits. So it's already subject to review. So if it's already subject to review, then FSA is going to consider it as that met FSA review criteria. That's why producers are encouraged to use RMA data. A large percentage of producers in Illinois uh, have uh, crop insurance. And so if it's an APH plan, then they're going to use uh, their actual yield data, not the APH yield. Now, if you have something like grip insurance, um, even though you may be giving some yield data to your insurance agent, um, that's not yield data that was subject to review because you're using the county yield. And so don't get caught up in thinking that you're getting uh, yield data to your crop insurance agent, therefore you can use that because that was not subject to review. The RMA um, data that was certified must represent the total harvested and appraised production divided by the planted acres on the, of the crop on the farm for the year. Again, certified yields will be required to be supported by production evidence if it's requested by FSA. The last time we updated yields, FSA said up front that we're going to spot check 100% um, of the yield updates. We started out that way for several months and we completed a number of reviews of yield updates, but we did not end up doing 100%. Now, we're going to tell you that FSA has no plans of doing 100% of the reviews of updated yields for this farm bill. Yields on the FSA 658 for the acre program, which the last farm bill had a direct and counter sickle program as well as an acre program. Uh, the enrollment in acre was small. It was only about 10 or 12%. Um, but if you were enrolled in acre, you can use your evidence to support your yield certification. If you have a crop that's in the NAP program, you have NAP yield data, non-assured assistance program. 
Um, you can use that data. RMA data is encouraged to be used. Again, though RMA ATH yields are not acceptable yields, the advantage of using NAP yields and uh, acre uh, yields is they were already subject to audit or review, and so they're automatically considered to have met the criteria, just like RMA yield data was subject to audit and review, and is therefore deemed to have been satisfied as meeting the criteria. Hybrid seed or, or hybrid seed or popcorn, we're typically talking hybrid corn, hybrid seed corn, but it could be so, uh, soybeans. Uh, there's some options available to those producers. If both the commercial crop acreage and the hybrid seed or popcorn acreage is grown on the farm and they have like practices, irrigated or non-irrigated, then the owner can certify the yield for planted acre from the commercial acreage to the hybrid seed or popcorn acres. <laughs> so if I have hybrid seed corn and um, I also have commercial corn on the farm and my they're both irrigated practices or they're both non-irrigated practices and my commercial corn made 200 bushel to an acre, then I can consider that my popcorn acres made 200 bushels to the acre. I cannot use this option though if my hybrid seed corn was irrigated and my commercial corn was non-irrigated, they didn't have like practices. For hybrid seed, there's also a commercial equivalent uh, option. If the contract that they're entering into uh, provides for a commercial equivalent yield to calculate payments, but it can't exceed 120% of the county average yield. Now, this is an option that's generally not available for popcorn. Then you have a third option, which is hybrid seed or popcorn, where the entire county grows it. And that, neither of the two previous methods work, they can use the county average yield. And then the default method is if none of these options work, the county average yield can be used for the hybrid seed corn or popcorn acreage. Now, let me tell you that it's very likely that there will be an option, additional option added and it's going to be late, but it's going to be for popcorn, and it will provide a factor where you take your popcorn pounds divided by this factor, and then you'll come up with a commercial corn equivalent. If you're a popcorn producer, and, they, and you need that option because the other option up here wasn't available, then call your county office and get on the register so that when that policy comes out, and I think it'll be out shortly, then you'll be able to utilize it because you're on their register. RMA records or TEPO records, production previously reported at FSA. I mentioned ACRE before, NAP, marketing assistant loans, MAL, commercial receipts, settlement sheets, pick records, load summaries. We like these records and we like them in the order that they're listed. Contemporaneous records are, are scale tickets, pick records, records of fed production. It could be something read on a piece of paper where you grind feed, but it's a contemporaneous record, which means at the moment, it's not something you sit down at the kitchen table and put together for us. It's something that you were doing daily and you were making records, uh, notes, and become part of your record keeping. Uh, that's a contemporaneous record. Appraisal information from loss adjusters or contractors are acceptable records as well. Verifiable records, still acceptable record, but it's verifiable, including contemporaneous records, they're going to be dated, they're going to show disposition, the quantity and price, they're going to be seasonal, and they're going to be provided if they're requested. We can go verify them with somebody, a third party, who you sold it to, that this is a good or verifiable record. Reliable records are a lower standard, but they're copies of receipts, ledgers, income statements, register tapes, uh, invoices for custom harvesting, pick records. Uh, we may still be able to use those. These generally are going to apply to crops other than corn, soybeans, wheat, um, because they have um, other means of disposition. Stored production, if it's measured by FSA or crop insurance, used for seed or fed production. And if fed production is not measured to convert it, it can have a substitute yield applied. But we're changing our policy, and uh, uh, there's conflict in our handbook, 
And so we will allow producers fed production to get a county uh, average yield um, based on that new revised policy that will be coming out uh, if they need to utilize that option. And again, it will pertain to fed production. For grade stylings, hay production, uh, we'll look at silage appraisal or measurements. We'll convert that to bushels of pounds, depending on the crop, and the yields will be substituted uh, if they cannot be determined. So we have a partial, a plug or a substitute yield option available for grain silage or hay production. Commingle production, we can decommingle production and we have some options available for that. But of course, we prefer to use your, your RMA data if you were certifying your yields uh, because decommingling uh, can become complicated. You can Decommingle your certified production because by number one, probably the most common one, is producers can use the same yield on all farms for that year if the commingled production represents an average yield of all farms for the applicable year. Now, of course, the problem with that is if you've got farms that are uh, highly variable in their yields, then you're going to have the same yield. Uh, so you may want to to uh, use a different option for decommingling. Producers can use the planted acres across between farms. Uh, producers can use uh, LDP or MLA records along with the program, marketing assistance loans. But quite frankly, we haven't had it as many of those we have in the past years. Again, they can use RMA records based on <laughs> ACH records. Now, what many people are concerned about is the spot check policy and we don't have the spot check policy available to share with you but we do know this we do know that there's going to be a national spot check selection as there is each and every year that a certain number of producers are selected and we review everything about their farming operation in regard to any farm program participation and so if you're selected for a national spot check selection for 2014 15 through 18 uh, we'll look and you certify your yields. We'll look at your production evidence. The other one that's going to catch uh, more people, but still only a percentage or a fraction of the participants that certify the yields, is this one right here. The yields over a certain percentage of the county average yield. We have a report function that's available. The county office can enter anywhere from 75% to 150%. And what that means is that they enter 150%. Your net and your yield certification will end up being 150% or more of the county average yield. Your name will be on that report and you'll be spot checked. Now, I can't tell you today if that's going to be 150% or it's going to be 140 or 130 or 125. But if you're above that percentage that is selected, then you're going to be spot checked. If you're below that percentage, and obviously, I wouldn't think we'd look at anybody at 100% or below um, of the county average yield, and maybe not even 110 or 115 or 120 percent. But I'm telling you, I don't know what that percentage is going to be. But if you're above it, you'll be looked at. If you're below it, you will not be looked at. Again, like in 2002 and 2008, yields provided via the RMA data are considered to have met the review criteria. Producers must have records for review upon request, and that will be the owner that will be asking for that. And so it's important that the owner either has, continues to have access to the producer's records or has them already provided to them and retains those in a file drawer somewhere. Obviously, um, they can elicit the assistance of their operator, um, but be mindful that we're talking about as late as 2018, we could come and ask an owner for the evidence. And so relationships change between an operator and a tenant. Um, tenants have their farm tenancy terminated, they retire, uh, they become deceased. Um, we will be asking the owner for the records, not the uh, operator. Uh, that was on the farm when the yield was certified. Uh, with that, I'd like to use the rest of the time we have available for questions. 
Stan, thanks again for that information. Um, for everybody listening, if you have questions, type them in, and I will uh, relay them to Stan for answer or to get his answer and thoughts on it. And I want to go back to the uh, crop insurance uh, questions. We've got a few of them that have come up during the presentation, and you covered this well, but I want to just sort of highlight it and clarify it for everybody because one of the things that we get in a lot of these meetings is, look, I've got, my, I've got crop insurance on an enterprise basis or even a, a basic feed, and you just pulled up a computer screen, by the way. Um, Thanks. The uh, the question we get a lot then is well how do I you know I've got four FSA farms under that that insurable unit whether it's enterprise or not how do I make that work and so obviously and you made I think you made the point very clear that you can't you're not plugging in your APH you got to go back and find the 2008 to 12 yield numbers uh, the production divided by the acres that's on that crop insurance form but if that crop insurance record applies to multiple FSA farms what are what are you guys doing at FSA to deal with that. Well, I understand there's some, you know, there's a certain amount of angst about uh, issues just like that because it's very simple to say here's what, here's here's what you do. But when you get to an actual farming operation, it can get very complicated because you have, you know, the, the individual that has one owner, uh, whether they're an owner and they have a share rent or it's cash rent, uh, or or you're an owner operator to dozens of farms. Um, whenever you have an enterprise unit, um, we'll take that RMA data, but you're going to need to use the same yield for every farming operation covered by that enterprise unit because that's the way you've certified it. Now, the other thing you have to be mindful of is look at your farming structure today and Keep in mind whether or not the farming structure changed for 8, 2008, 2009, 2010, because the situation very likely could be um, that the yield that you certified to RMA was for X number of acres, but you added a farm, and today you have more acreage on your farm than you did back then, and you're not taking into account the yield on that acreage. And that's where we talk about the partial plug. So then it gets complicated because some time has passed, number one. And number two, then, where you do the math of a partial plug on the acreage that you picked up and have today, but you didn't have an eight or nine or ten, can become kind of a little complicated. But back to your, your point about the enterprise units, um, just be certain that the yield that was provided RMA is for the same acres that you're looking at today. Right, so that would end up covering multiple FSA farms in that example. So you'd use the same yield across farms. You don't have to try and separate out yield by farm. It would, and yeah. it just points out the, the difficulty um, is that RMA allows for enterprise units and they don't always equate and come back nicely to FSA farm serial numbers and you could be looking at an enterprise unit that covers one, two, three, five FSA uh, farm serial numbers. Yeah. Thank you for that answer. Um, one question that just showed up here about spot checks. Uh, will spot checks be conducted only on producers who do not certify using RMA data? In other words, uh, does RMA data in any way, uh, sh not shield, but does it, can you still get spot checked if you're using RMA? Well, you know, I'll say yes and no is the best way to answer it. Uh, yes, you can be selected for spot check, but the advantage of RMA data then is we're not going to ask you to bring in production evidence to prove your RMA yield because it was already spot, subject to spot check or audit. We won't look at the production. We're just going to look to be sure you use the correct yield that you were using for RMA. Right. Does that make sense? In other words, I don't want to see the documentation, the settlement sheets, because that was already subject to, that portion was already subject to review. But I want to, as an FSA employee, I want to determine that, yeah, you did use your RMA cert, uh, certified actual yields. Right. 
So really what, what the RMA data provides you then is just that's, that's the only piece of data and information you need to provide at a spot check, but it does not preclude you from being spot checked. You, would, you could still be spot checked with RMA data. Correct. Um, we had a question about seed corn yields, and I believe you probably answered that, cause you, uh, but maybe just do a really brief refresher on how you update seed corn yields that you're using uh, um, on the farm. Yeah, I think you had that. There we go. Yeah. Well, first of all, for uh, hybrid seed corn, uh, for hybrid seed, uh, this is uh, very similar to what we had in the previous farm bill, uh, except for this option is new, and this really fits more of the Dakotas and, uh, than it does in Illinois County, uh, North Dakota County. Um, so it's no different. Um, if you have both hybrid seed corn and commercial corn on the farm, and they're both like practices, and practices means irrigated or non-irrigated, then you can just take your commercial corn yield and apply it to your popcorn or hybrid seed corn uh, acreage. And that's an option that's available to you. But it's not uncommon, it's fairly common, that hybrid seed corn contracts have a commercial equipment used to calculate the payment. And it can be quite high. And so they can use that option as well if their contract uh, agreement they have with the uh, hybrid seed company, corn, corn company, um, they can use it not to exceed 120%. Now, what I didn't point out, I'll point out now, is if one or more of these options are available, the producer gets to pick which one to use. So if two or more uh, are applicable, producer can say, well, this one gives me X number of bushels and this one gives me X a different number of bushels, they can use the higher of the two choices. Right. Thank you. Uh, the last question we have, and uh, just remind everybody that's still on the line, if you've got questions, type them in. Um, the last one we have involves uh, getting signatures. The uh, question says, uh, you know, what about getting proper signatures from owners on estates, trust, LLC, et cetera? Uh, use of, of Form 901 to get those signatures. Um, just maybe a little, a little kind of a clarification on some of the paperwork involved when you're dealing with uh, – owners that are, you know, estates or trusts or LLCs? Sure. Um, our signature requirements are unchanged from previous farm bills. So if you're familiar with those, they're the same. But if you're not, um, used to we always had to get um, signature authority for entities such as estates, corporations, limited liability companies, et cetera. Um, and we needed to have uh, um, that information on the letterhead, <coughs> if it's a corporation, for example, of who can sign. But last farm bill, um, we, FSA also provided that in lieu of those documents, um, on a CCC 902, which is a farm operating plan, or 901, which is a, a, a supplemental form, uh, they can designate if they have signature authority for that entity. And it's really a self-certification and saying, you know, Stan Wilson signed for ABC Corporation. And we'll accept that if we have that on file, that they're certifying that they have and possess signature authority for that particular entity. And then if we ever have, if it ever comes an issue, and only if it become an issue, would we look into it and we found out in fact they did not have signature authority and then they could have je jeopardized um, their previous payments but if they have signature authority and whether it's on a 901 or 902 or we've been provided signature authority a document for an entity they're okay now i'll also tell you that um, this week uh, national conference call um, it appears that FSA may even be further relaxing their signature authority criteria, and that is if it's not a document in which a benefit is being requested, like a contract or an application, we wouldn't even require uh, documentation beforehand or afterwards. 
of whether or not they have seizure authority. Again, if no benefit is being requested, and of course on a, a yield certification, uh, our yield uh, update and base reallocation form, uh, you're not requesting a benefit. And so if that new policy uh, actually comes to be and we receive an update to our handbooks, uh, there's yet another uh, option available to producers, and that is you don't even have to worry about it if you're not requesting a benefit. Great. Thank you. One more question came in here, and this one's a little a little more detail, but uh, we've got a real-life uh, example. Uh, the individual says that they had purchased a farm in 2011, produced 100% of corn both on in 2011 and 12. The uh, Commodity Crop History Summary lists planted acres for only those two years, and when they run it through the spreadsheet, uh, the tools, it, it indicates a base reallocation of 100% corn base. It wants to know if that's correct. Um, and I think uh, the answer is yes, but I want to get your thoughts on that quickly. Well, they, they said that they bought it in 11, if I heard the question correctly, and yes. they produced corn in 11 and 12. And so the current makeup of that farm is uh, unchanged from 11. But... What we need to look at is what was planted on on that farm for the previous owner and operator, and so this, what they're telling us, or what they're telling you, is that they received a uh, letter back in August from FSA that gave the history. They're utilizing that history, but they haven't contacted the county office to to fill in the holes for the missing data. And I would encourage them to contact their, their recording county, the administrative county, and see what the um, uh, history was for the, those missing years, nine and 10. So in that situation then, where you've only got two years listed on the FSA letter, uh, FSA will go in and backfill the, the previous years based on what the previous owner had instead of what this owner is doing? Yes. Okay. And, and county offices have, uh, we're at over 96% for filling those holes. Okay. Uh, we call them holes, uh, and we've done a history dig, or we've done research to go back and and, and determine what those uh, what that missing history is. And so we've got that work done. Okay, that is good to know. So in that case, you, they, this individual needs to get in and and have that uh, sorted out at the FSA County Office to make sure that. Uh, They've got the correct numbers for base reallocation, the correct planted acres for reallocation. Um, and where, if there were no, if there had been no reported acres on that farm <clears throat> prior to 2011, then you would still go with the 11 and 12. Correct. Yeah. And of course, I'm, and, you know, we're looking at yield updates for this webinar, and so we've actually 2008, so we want to see if, if there was um, anything what the, what the yield data was for those years that are missing. Yeah. Well, we've got no further questions that have come in, so I think uh, we will uh, sign off here. Stan, again, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to, to uh, put on this webinar and, and, and help walk everybody through this decision. Um, very informative, very helpful, so we, we greatly appreciate it. Again, thank you for the opportunity, the invitation, first of all, and the opportunity to, uh, to make this presentation and for making your resources available to us. Yep, and thanks for everybody who tuned in today. And uh, this will be archived and put up on the Farm Bill Toolbox with the remaining uh, uh, webinars uh, to refer back to in case you need it. And future webinars are scheduled, and we'll be going through uh, more and more topics on the Farm Bill as we lead into the decision. So thanks, everybody. Have a great day.